We're just a few weeks away from the official release of Blender 4.2. This looks like it's going to be a really great version of Blender, so I wanted to just take a few moments to sit down and talk about some of the features that I'm most looking forward to. And the first thing that I have to talk about is EV Next, specifically the global illumination. Now, if you don't know about EV Next, that's a project that the Blender developers have been working on to take EV and fix some of its shortcomings and give it some extra features that people have been waiting for. So one of the features that people have wanted for a long time is global illumination. We're in cycles right now, and even though the inside of this box is not getting any direct sunlight, the light is coming in, it's hitting off the walls and it's lighting things up. That's called global illumination and that can happen uh, in cycles because it calculates light pretty much correctly. You can also say here that we actually have some red color that's coming off the monkey head itself when it's bouncing off. And that's something that traditional EV does not do at all. If we look at the same scene in EV, you can see that looks terrible. We have some light leak over here, which is a problem you can fix, but it's a problem nonetheless. But the inside of the cube is not being lit up at all. So how do we fix that? Well, in EV Next, you can see it already looks better because there's a little bit of light link, but not as much. But if you go down to here where we have this new ray tracing option, you can turn that on. And now we have some global illumination inside the box. We have the light coming in and bouncing. We also even have some of the red light coming off the monkey itself. Now, the thing about this ray tracing, um, because it's in Eevee, it is actually very flexible as well. You can change this max roughness value, which basically changes how much global illumination the scene is going to get. You can change the bias and there's various other things that you can play with there to really dial in the settings and try and make it look as realistic as possible. Blender has a new shader called the Ray Portal. The idea is very simple. What if you could basically project a view from inside your Blender scene onto a material? So you could just pick that material up and move it wherever you want. And then you could look around it. And even though we're looking at this plane over here, it looks like we're viewing it, viewing this box from over here. And any changes that we make to this is gonna be reflected over there in real time. But this is just a plane. We're just looking at literally a plane and what's happening over here is being projected over to here. It's got nothing to do with this camera, by the way. I can remove that. It's all controlled completely with the mapping nodes. We can actually move the scene around here. We can rotate things and it's an incredibly useful tool. One of the things I think this is going to be really, really useful for is the same thing that games would normally do something called parallax occlusion mapping for where basically we can have fake windows and it looks like each one of these windows has something inside it and we could even have people moving around inside the windows. But of course, all of these are actually just planes. It's a very um, unique tool. It's not like a shader that I was expecting to be made anytime right now. People are still trying to figure out exactly what to do with it, but it does have a lot of really good utilities. A long time ago, when Decoded was a new channel, I made a video about how to make fake bubbles in Blender. And the key to that was to replicate the iridescent effect that you get on greasy surfaces on top of water. You've probably noticed this before if you've ever actually looked at a bubble, especially in the sunlight, or if you've looked at fuel or something that's been spilled on the floor, you get this sort of rainbow of colors as the light refracts differently as it goes through the greasy surface compared to any other liquid there. So now we don't need a whole tutorial for that. We have this built straight into the principal shader. If I just turn this up to quite a high number, like 600 or 800, and then I increase the IOR, you'll start to see that we get this iridescent effect. And we can keep this quite low and have it subtle. And if we change these numbers around, we get very different effects and different hues of colors. And, I think it's great that we have stuff like this built straight into the principal shader now, whereas before I was having to make entire tutorials about how to do very basic effects like this. Going forward, your renders are gonna look better too because we have a new tone mapper in the color management. The tone mapper basically just tells uh, your screen how it should interpret the colors that are inside the render. Now, originally we had this standard uh, setting, which was the one that came with Blender out the box. It did a bad job of highlights such as around the sink and up near these lights. And also you sometimes got these really ugly, uh, very saturated lights like this. 
So as a replacement to that, first we got Filmic, which in general does look much more natural, but it is a little bit washed out. And sometimes the lights could look really unnatural. They're not too bad here, but sometimes emissive surfaces, instead of being kind of white like they should be, would be a very saturated color. Recently, we got AGX, which was definitely improvement. This scene was actually built using AGX, so this is the sort of colors that I had in mind when I was making it. But one problem that I always run into with AGX is that things tend to uh, lose some of their natural saturation. I'm using mostly PBR textures here, and you can see, for instance, where I've got the highlights. This is actually quite a dark brown color, quite a saturated brown, but yet it still kept getting washed out. So to fix this problem, we now have this Kronos PBR Neutral. And if we stick it into that, you can see this does a much better job of actually respecting the colors that are inside the textures. Now, this scene wasn't built with this tone mapper in mind, so I would definitely tone down some of these colors if that's what I was gonna do, but it's definitely nice to have a new tone mapper that we can try out when we're not getting the sort of look in a scene that we want. If you use Blender's compositing tools a lot, you've probably experienced the pain of adding one too many nodes and all of a sudden your renders take ages to process every time. Well, if you've ever run into that before, there is now a solution which can help you figure out exactly which node or groups of nodes are taking so long. If you go to the overlay panel in the compositor, we have this thing called timings. And if we turn this on and then activate one of these nodes, Blender now tells us exactly how long this took to compute. And we can do this with all these nodes and turn each one of them on so we can see the lens distortion here is taking 21 milliseconds compared to just 4.6 for the blur. So if we wanted to reduce render times and we were thinking about maybe getting rid of one of these nodes, this would be the one to do it. The same with the viewer node, that's actually taking time every render. So if you don't need it when you're rendering, I would suggest you delete that. This bathroom scene was created as the first major update to my interior masterclass training course. This update adds three and a half hours of new training focused on creating a realistic bathroom scene. This is in addition to the original course, which included seven and a half hours of footage showcasing my entire workflow as I create a Victorian style living room. The masterclass is not a follow along tutorial. It's an opportunity to watch my entire workflow from start to finish with detailed narration of every step and every trick that I use. To celebrate the new module going live, I'm giving a 20% discount on all sales via Gumroad if you use the code module2 at checkout. The course can also be picked up at Blender Market. Check out the link in the description to pick up your copy of the Interior Masterclass while the discount is still valid. Blender's new extension service, uh, extensions.blender.org, has also now launched. If you don't know about extensions, it's basically a platform that the Blender team have made to host uh, what we would normally call add-ons and also themes. So if you go to preferences, where add-ons would normally be, you now have themes and extensions. And if we press this, the first time you do it, you'll have to give a permission to connect to the internet. And basically it means that we can download and share uh, different themes and different add-ons in the community all all for free and the built-in functionality of this means because it's connected to the internet it can be updated from inside blender as well so you don't have to go to ex external websites anymore to download add-ons that are free or to keep them updated you can do it all from inside blender so if i go to bulltron here for instance and i click install i've now got the bulltron add-on whatever that is now the really cool thing about this, if you go to extensions.blender.org and see what all of these extensions do, and you can actually just drag and drop them straight from the website into Blender and install them like that. The last feature that I want to talk about is a small thing, but I thought it was worth mentioning at the end because it's a really nice quality of life improvement and something I've actually wanted to see in Blender for a while now. Um, when you're working with modifier stacks, Quite often there's a particular modifier that you always want to be at the bottom. For instance, it might be the wireframe modifier. You might want the wireframe to be the last function that's added every time. But the problem is when you add new things in, you're gonna to have to grab the modifier and you're always gonna to have to keep moving it to the bottom. If you're dealing with a big modifier stack, that gets pretty annoying. But now we have this option where you can press the arrow 
and you can pin to last. And now if you add a, let's say a displacement, it's gonna make sure that the wireframe modifier is always at the bottom of the stack. Oh my God, that's pretty awful, isn't it? What's the creepy looking monkey head? Um, yeah, so that's the last thing that I wanted to talk about. I haven't been able to use 4.2 much yet because I've been working on this course update, which was built in the last version of Blender and I didn't want to switch over halfway through. But what I've seen of it so far looks very, very cool. I'm really excited to play with some of these features. Thank you for watching this video, guys. Don't forget to hit the like button and make sure you check out the links in the description where you can get the interior masterclass and the new module 20% off at Gumroad with the code module 2.